Hello and welcome to series two of Chatterbox. My name is Callum and I'm an associate artist at Playbox Theatre, the company who created Chatterbox. For those of you new to Chatterbox, this is an ongoing series of conversations with actors and artists from across the industry. And what a series we've got for you this summer. We'll be talking to the star of Sex Education, Amy Lou Wood, Olivier nominated writer Laura Wade, and even the Shadow Culture Secretary, herself a former actor, Tracy Braben. And guess what? This is our second series. So we've already got a whole back catalogue of fantastic interviews you can dive into, all for free. We've got interviews with Pirates of the Caribbean star Kevin McNally, BAFTA, Olivier and Emmy nominated actor Juliet Stevenson, multi award winning Hamlet, Parker Essiedu, and even the creators of The Play That Goes Wrong, Charlie Russell and Dave Hearn, amongst many, many others. If you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, just head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theatre. And I cannot tell you how excited I am to add today's guest to that impressive list. But before we meet them, a quick reminder that, as always, we want you to get involved in these conversations too. So if you're one of the lucky 100 young people with me now in this Zoom interview, get those questions coming in. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen on a laptop and the top of your screen on a mobile, then you'll find a button you can click to send questions directly into my inbox. Importantly, you'll be able to see the questions other people have asked and you can vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered. The more votes, the higher they appear in my inbox. And if you like someone else's question, but you want to add an idea or perhaps have a follow up or related question, you can now comment on other people's questions as well. So have a look at what other people are asking too. And as always, we'll try to get through as many as we can. If you're watching live on Facebook, Though you can't message in questions, we still want to hear from you. So send us your reactions, your comments, your feedback to at Playbox Theatre, hashtag Chatterbox on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook. We don't mind which. Now it's time to introduce my special guest. George Mackay needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. George started acting professionally aged just 11 years old when a talent scout visited his school and cast him as Curly in Peter Pan alongside Jason Isaacs. He's most well known for his roles in the films Private Peaceful alongside Jack O'Connell, Pride alongside Bill Nye, and Captain Fantastic alongside Viggo Mortensen. His stage work is equally as impressive. He was in Our Wilderness at The Young Vic, The Caretaker at The Old Vic with Timothy Spall and Daniel Mays. But earlier this year, he took the lead role of Lance Corporal Will Schofield in the smash hit film 1917. It was nominated for three Golden Globes, eight Critics Circle Awards, nine BAFTAs and ten Oscars. Let's take a look at the trailer. In your own time, gentlemen. Must be something bigger for channels here. You have a brother in the 2nd Battalion? Yes, sir. They're walking into a trap. Your orders are to deliver a message calling off tomorrow morning's attack. If you fail, it will be a massacre. We've got orders to cross here. That is the German front line. Oh, if we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. Get there in time. 
we will lose 1,600 men. Your brother among them. Good luck. so thrilled to welcome our first guest for series two of Chatterbox. It is the insanely talented George Mackay. George, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Callum. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you've had a big year, George. You've been to the Golden Globes, the Oscars. You did The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. I wondered, has isolation been a bit of a nice break for you? Yeah, yeah, it's been good. I was actually um, spent. I've spent most of isolation with my family um, and, my, and my loved ones, so that was really nice. It's you know first time being back, you know, together with with everyone, all of us in the same house um, together for a wee while. So uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's nice to touch base with family. And now we, we've got to talk about 1917. I mean, it was stunning, oh, particularly me. at the moment when it feels like the world's on fire a little bit. I, I felt really grateful to be sitting in the cinema and to be reminded of what can actually happen, you know, when we're really nasty to one another. Um, and it's also kind of, you know, beautifully shot and impeccably cast. What was it like getting the phone call from your agent saying, hey, George, you're going to be the lead in a first World War blockbuster directed by Oscar winner Sam Mendes? Well, it was, it was funny. I actually... I found out I'd, I'd um, so I auditioned for the role. I did an audition tape with Nina Gold, who's a casting lady, who's um, she's a wonderful casting director, who's been very kind to me over the years. And then I read did my second audition with Sam, and then the third audition was with Sam Mendes, the director, and Dean, who plays Blake, and it's the two soldiers on this journey together. And I was actually at the theatre seeing Sam's play, the Lehman trilogy, when I'd spoken to my agent on the way to the theatre because I'd wanted to. I, I knew that it was kind of there was going to be a yes or a no probably that week. I said, is there, is there any news? And she went, no, 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 no news, no news. And then I got a text from her at the interval saying, oh, meet me after the show, come say hey. So I, um, and, and at the time she said, what, what are you going to see? I said, I'm seeing the Lehman Trilogy. So no way, I'm seeing the Lehman Trilogy. So then um, I, at the, the interval, I get this text. And so after the show, I, was, I was, um, went, went and saw her outside the National Theatre where it was on. And she went, you've got it! And the Lehman Trilogy was Sam's place. So I picked her up and gave her a hug there on the South Bank. And it was, uh, yeah, it was a lovely moment and funny to be at the theatre for Sam's show the night of finding out. Yeah, how serendipitous. Yeah, yeah. Um, and did you have any idea when you were filming it that it was going to be such a kind of huge award-winning movie? Uh, no, no, not at all. Like I think, I think we were all very the the, the script that Sam and Christy Wilson Cairns wrote together was, it's it's just, was just the most beautiful script. And and it was before I even read the script um, that the auditions the, the audition stage it was just um, the two um, scenes. I had two scenes to audition with, and it was in the second audition that Sam said, "Look, the idea for this film is it's going to be one continuous take, and therefore it's going to be a process kind of like unlike any other." film usually where we're going to have to rehearse for months because we're essentially going to have to choreograph the film because you know you have to decide upon the emotional rhythm in the way that you usually do with an edit we have to decide upon that already because when the camera doesn't cut and you're moving that dictates the size of the set so already it was this idea of that it was going to be a fascinating process um and it was really thrilling the idea of being involved in that process from early on but but you know, and the, but the process was so kind of constant and gradual. We just kind of built layers, sort of without really knowing. I guess knowing what we were inside of to an extent. I think we we knew that we had we had the possibility to be a really wonderful film. But um, but it was very focused on just achieving it, like rather than how it would be received. It wasn't all oh, this is going to be really you know good or bad or or whatever. It was just like, we need to get this done. There was so much to think about in the doing of it. We sort of got that far. And then it was a wonderful surprise when it we sort of was received how it was. And, and as far as I'm aware, you weren't playing a real soldier, but the events of the film were inspired by a real military operation, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of an amalgamation of things where it was a real, a real happening within the First World War where the German um, the Germans, um, army create this, what was called the Hindenburg line, where basically in the trench warfare, there'd been 
at a sort of stalemate. I, I can't remember how long that section of trench is, but essentially fighting over the, this couple of hundred meters of land for years and seemingly overnight to, um, to, the, um, to the British and the Allied forces, suddenly the Germans disappeared and they seemed to have retreated. And, and what they had done is that this kind of where the, it kind of went in a big semicircle. If you think of a semicircle going away from yourself, mm -hmm. they had flattened that line five miles back. And so that massive line had then been kind of compounded into this much further back, but sort of ultimate line of attack and defense. And they were kind of waiting for the British to kind of run, kind of go, well, we won the war, we're going at them, to sort of run at them, not knowing that they were heading into this kind of, this trap basically and um so that was a real sort of part of history and i think sam sam struck upon that because the first world war was very static and he wanted to make he knew he wanted to make a film about a journey because the other thing that the film was inspired by was sam's grandfather sam the director his grandfather fought in the first world war and was a messenger and just this image of a singular soldier delivering a message across no man's land was one of the stories that his Sam's grandfather told him and it always stuck with Sam. So to sort of have a whole film that could be in real time of a journey, you needed a situation where there could be more movement than was typical of the First World War. How interesting. I mean, you mentioned there some of the um, research is based on. Mm. I wonder how much you, uh, you know, got stuck into that in your process. Because obviously there's essays, first-hand accounts, you know, um, yeah. oh, it's like Wilfred Owen. You know, is that a big part of your process or, or do you kind of focus more on the, the story you're telling rather than the, the it's, world it's from? It's, no, it's an amalgamation of both. I think it's um, a mixture of, you know, the, the script was so beautiful. And I think with all projects, the script is your kind of your backbone to everything and your, you know, is, is the core of everything. And with this script, we, we had to be vet, we had to adhere to it completely because it was a blueprint for the entire production all elements of it but that said in understanding i mean the script was written christy and sam did a huge amount of research and just to understand the character because there's not a huge amount of exposition there's not a huge amount of dialogue where you kind of what i love about it is you don't get let into the character's thoughts but you have to exist with them in real time and to, to therefore to know have a kind of an imagined version of what these men had these characters had gone through that came from researching the, the copious amounts that of research that there is available for the first world war and and a lot of that came from first-hand accounts and you know there was uh, there was an audio book of um called uh, forgotten voices of the great war and it's of uh, recordings of veterans later in life speaking about on both sides, speaking about things that they saw. And some of it, what, some of my favorite stuff was the not so dramatic stuff. It was breakfast. It was like how these guys made, made breakfast. And you want to know the ins and outs of all the rhythms of their day. And, you know, there was some terrible, terrible story about, you know, picking up friends who have been, like blown up and you know and and they're sort of them coming apart in their arms and the horrors of it but then there are also equally stories that there was this one fella who used to save up his ration of cheese throughout the week and then they'd also get a ration of bacon ration of bacon and he would ha have his cheese and he would cook the bacon on his mess tin over the over over a flame and then with the the grease that was then he'd keep the, the bacon then with the grease from the bacon he'd add a drop of water so it wouldn't stick then he'd grill the cheese and he'd melt cheese <sighs> then he'd get if he was lucky enough to have a piece of bread he'd use bread otherwise it was biscuits he'd have melted cheese and bacon on a biscuit and he'd like you know it would take a few days to save up enough cheese to make that breakfast but that was like wow. his favorite thing and i just love that I, that's that's as in that's as important to me as as the horrors as well you know um and you mentioned there the the um that it feels immersive that you're you know you can't you're with this character for the whole film um and that you know there's a fantastic moment that i think we saw in the trailer there where you're running towards camera across the battlefield and there are people you know charging into you and we really do feel the desperation in that moment for you your character trying to save these people's lives i mean how on earth do you go about sort of rehearsing and shooting something like that well it started off with that particular sort of big run um well, we filmed, we began filming in April and in November, the year before, we were on with a golf buggy on that empty field with about a dozen crew being 
those what would become hundreds of men testing out okay does it look good if people go in between the camera is that safe to do so how far back do pe- how evenly spread would they go um talking to the military advisor as to you know they were i think it was six feet apart as they went over the over the top and kind of going okay well how fast how fast can you run george like how fast would the character, how tired would the character be? Can we do that with a golf buggy? How are we going to film it? Is Does the camera wobble too much? It was just, you know, we were, they were very lucky with the budget that we had, that we had the means to just test and test and test. And we sort of came back and the whole film, we would work at it in layers and we'd sort of get an idea of kind of, okay, that worked. And, you know, we'd have all the crew that were there on the location recce on that first day in November, 12, you know, 12 or maybe more, I think 20 people, going go and like trying to run in between the camera and you know wow. and I was in I had the the half the costume and then just sort of tracksuit bottoms and boots in the bottom and um and then when we came back you know it would then be the logistics we'd sort of grow that next process so then we'd do it with more people and then we'd do it the way that the camera has to move it the camera actually came to achieve that shot began on one crane inside the trench if the trench is there the camera was dangled inside of it from a crane that was on one edge was then moved on an electric arm unhooked by two of the grips who were in costume because they couldn't get out of the shot (laughs) onto a moving vehicle that had a crane on the back and as it set off the then two grips would then run around and become the soldiers that entered into it so it was this amazing dance and then everyone you see we had i think over 400 background artists uh, on the day as well and all the all the explosions were practical as well so we would just rehearse for days and days and days with all of those guys, safe distances. And then also like mistakes wind up in the film, like my character gets knocked over a number of times and we'd rehearsed it so that I didn't fall over. And it just, that's what happened in the sort of, in the heat of the moment, we'd rehearse for days kind of going, boom. But then when <laughs> the explosion goes, boom, but that everyone was like, we were all kind of in the world of it and focus them, you know, take hits. But the kind of the rule was always don't stop unless Sam says stop. So we just kept on carrying on and it wound up, you know, winding up in the film because it was true to life. Well, that idea, that thing of not stopping if things go wrong, that's kind of more like a play almost, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's more similar to that process. Um, I'd, I'd love, love to ask a bit about your, your work on stage as well. Um, mm. So I know you've worked with Matthew Walkers. Yeah. the director uh, and you've worked with him both on film and on stage you did pride with him and then a few years later the caretaker yeah was it interesting working with the same director in two different mediums do you kind of notice a big shift in his process i don't know if i noticed a massive shift in his process i think purely because i didn't have as much access to it on pride because there were so many of us involved um he sort of, uh, Matthew, when we began that film, we ha- we were blessed with a two week rehearsal process, which is kind of rare in film, where we essentially very roughly, without emotionally going into the scenes, blocked the scenes because he just said, look, there's a very logistical element to this and we don't have much time. And in most scenes, there are about 11 people and usually sometimes all of you are talking. So how can we naturally find a way to shoot you in small groups? or in multiple, you know, because we can't do medium close up on every single person because we'd be here forever. So he said, he also said, you know, you're to know your lines because when we come to shoot of it, we're working quickly. So there was a real sort of pragmatism, which I think was born out of theater where, you know, you're expected to know your lines because there's an audience watching you where I think sometimes with film, there's some people can become a bit looser in terms of like, yeah, just letting them feel the moment and you, perhaps people are you know or self you know you you become less prepared in a way and but then with the caretaker because there were only three of us in the cast it was much more focused than I could there was more of an active dialogue I guess but then that said Matthew sort of um Matthew's an amazing director in that I think his directing is almost subconscious like he does, he really doesn't say that much in the room, and especially it's funny. Like I'm, well, both productions, I was very nervous and wanted him to be saying loads, you know, like good or bad, just like tell me what's happening, like where am I going wrong, you know, and yeah. and he doesn't, and it sort of makes you kind of figure it out for yourself, you know. You do the first couple of goes, kind of watching to see what he's thinking, and then you can't tell what he's thinking, so you just go right. Well, I've got to, I've got to offer something. I've got to figure it out. So. And then you sort of, and he'll just give very insightful sort of little nuggets along the way. Like, 
even in terms of the physicality of the roles and the caretaker, he said that he likes to imagine. And I don't know if, I think he said he does this with all his productions. I mean, I can't speak for him, but I, what he said, well, at least in this instance, he said like, I often imagine the characters as a, either a prop or a piece of the set. And they sort of, those objects embody the characters. So, you know, Davies might be an old sock, Aston might be the broken toaster and Nick, uh, and Nick is a knife. And so as soon as he said that, I was like, okay, right. Well, if I'm a knife, that's, that's how you cut into that. That's where you say the dialogue. That's the focus. That's the way you move across stage and stuff. I'll be the knife in this, you know, I'll be the knife to your smelly sock, you know, that kind of, and it, I don't know, just those figurative, figurative understandings of a character or, or, or a scene or a process, I find really helpful. And how did you find working on a, on a Pinter play? Cause I have to say, I, I sometimes find Pinter quite a difficult thing mm. to watch. I sometimes come out feeling like I'm a bit <laughs> stupid, like I've missed something or there's, I mean, I love the kind of tone and atmosphere he creates, but I, I sometimes feel I'm out of the loop slightly. Um, I wondered if that was something that you guys kind of dealt with in rehearsal. Did you try and answer those questions or did you kind of embrace the ambiguity of his writing? It's, it's a bit of both. Like, I loved, I did a, did a p- bit of Pinter in school. It was like a warm up there. <laughs> I, did, um, I did a bit of Pinter in school and loved it. And my drama teacher at school loves Pinter. And what I love is the ambiguity of it is that it's kind of, it's amazing writing because, but oftentimes I think what, what characters say is seemingly so nonsensical. It's, it's like a blank canvas with which then you can characterize it. You can decide what those sort of seemingly random streams of consciousness or phrases mean to you and mean to the character. And that's where it's fun because it gives you a real sense of ownership over this beautiful language. But then the one thing that I did learn was it's how important it is to adhere to the writing. You know, it's amazing writing where, and Matthew would say this is you need to, you need to respect the writing and respect the punctuation. And again, having, not done much theatre like doing doing film where some of the time different processes especially if it's a more modern piece they'll be like yeah yeah, make it your own you know they improvise around that bit and you you know and this that's not say that's wrong or either one is wrong or right but you sort of use the kind of paraphrasing and to making it your own and turning it into your own words and throwing in an okay or knowing that it's okay if you left that pause there because the edit can tighten it up as long as you had the intention and so you get a bit more sort of messy and fluid and and sometimes that feels really creative and exciting where with Pinter it was amazing because you have to be so strict because almost when you see it on the page you can see the rhythm of like pause pause and it only becomes funny when you start doing the rhythm or it only becomes scary when you start doing the rhythm okay. and it was sort of observing the pause and and not putting in a pause when there's not, because there's the whole pin to pause thing. But it's sort of, it's like, I don't know, it's, it's, there's a lot to do with, it, the play was so, when I first read it, I thought it was hilarious. And then when we performed it, we'd sort of forgotten how funny it could be. Because I think it's, it's again, it's like the rhythms of a joke. You know, you've got some, you've got a member of your family or a friend who just knows how to tell a joke. And then you try and tell it the same. And the rhythm's slightly off and it's just not as funny. <laughs> and it, it's because there's so much or like, you know, or like the blues or something. It's like it, there's a there's a rhythm to stuff. And if you're just half a bar out, it just doesn't quite sound as good. It's still the same notes. It's still the same chord, but it's just not it doesn't quite hit. And the thing about, yeah, that I loved about Pinter is that so much of the drama is done for you if you just hit the structure, because it's kind of it's a little bit like music in terms of the words are so random. You sort of of course you need to know what you're meaning and underneath them, but they are sort of nonsensical that the, 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 it's the rhythm that makes it either threatening or it's the rhythm that makes it funny. Mm-hmm. And you could be sort of speaking gobbledygook in some, in some ways, like, and it's, and it, and it doesn't really matter. Um, I guess it's quite well, rather like Shakespeare in, on, in that sense, the rhythm is so kind of key to the feeling of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I'd be reticent to speak too much because I've only done, a bit of Shakespeare at school, but I would I would love to learn it because of the few times I've auditioned for Shakespeare and things, and I've spoken to a friend who's amazingly practiced at it, and and he says that because he and he would teach me that he'd unlock it. He's like if you 
look at where the line's going or where the punctuation is taking you. And you realize, as you say, rhythm unlocks, you know, unlocks something. Um, so, yeah. Have you read um, Pinter on Shakespeare? No, no, I he, haven't. He wrote a kind of like four page essay sort of praising Shakespeare. Really? It's, um, yeah. I mean, it's you sort of feel like Pinter's showing off a little bit, but he but he clearly also has a a great deal of respect for for Shakespeare as well. Um, it's well worth the read. Um, now, just before we take some quest some more questions from the young people here, I just sort of want to rewind slightly and talk about the very start of your uh, career. Now, I know you you started professionally when you were eleven, doing Peter Pan in Australia, yeah, and then a few other jobs. Um, uh, but I think you applied to drama school at one point, and yeah. as happens for you know thousands of people every year, those auditions didn't go your way. Yeah. And I only bring this up just because lots of young people watching will have had similar experiences or may be going through that process at the moment. Yeah. I wondered if that was uh, a difficult knockback for you, and whether you ever considered going down another path. It was it was really important actually, like the 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 audition process. I think. I was so lucky when I was younger to, you know, I sort of fell into it accidentally. I always loved acting, but it wasn't until my sort of first experience of work where, you know, Shaheen Beg, the casting lady, um, the casting director, sorry, she um, she came around my school and picked out a bunch of boys to go for an audition. So it was a, it was a chance happening, which turned into this first experience, which was suddenly like, this is a job, like, oh my word. Um, and then because I was at school, I, I didn't, and, and also my parents' attitude to it, and and the agent that I was with, a lovely lady named Catherine Fleming, who was actually at an adult agency, and I was the only child on her books, and so I, I didn't get put up for as much as as many projects. But the projects I did do were, I guess, more adult, and so I could watch adult actors, um, and uh, and I, and I, I think, but I think that the thing of it still being at school, and not working that much necessarily, like working consistently, there was never the pressure that I guess I think a lot of people must feel as to like, you know, if you're 18 and you're deciding upon it, it's yeah. like, is this going to be my career? Is this, am I going to be able to, you know, am I going to do the projects creatively? Am I going to do what I want? Am I going to be as good as I want to be immediately? Am I going to be able to pay bills if I do this? And if I can't pay bills, can I, will I have enough time to prepare the auditions? And I was sort of got to do a lot of learning without that pressure but the in terms of auditioning for drama school, I, I basically I worked with an actor who I just Eddie Marzan, who I just thought was the bee's knees, and so respected him, and he was so professional and so good at his job, and he so respected his craft and his training, and he respected his training so much. I thought I need to I need to train. I need to learn how I can have a toolkit like like Eddie does, so to go about my work. And so I, I wasn't, I, I auditioned for Radha and Lambda because those were the two that I knew. And, um, and it was a sort of quite a quick process to, to sort of get, cause I'd missed the, the earlier part of the year. It was a sort of quite a quick consideration. Um, cause I think in all honesty, I'd sort of assumed that I would just try and keep working. And it wasn't until I was so kind of moved with working by it with Eddie that I thought, actually, this is definitely, I want to try drama school. Um, but and the, the process was fascinating because it was again talking of Shakespeare. I'd used to in a I was used to a much more a much briefer way of working with with films, playing smaller characters in films where you're in and you're out. And suddenly to prepare a two minute classical monologue um, was a whole different task and gave me a whole new respect for for language for performance and um, and 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 just the pro yeah the, the whole process of it. And when I didn't get in. I was, I was definitely, I was, dis I was disappointed, but I remember thinking this is a good, this is a kick up the bum because I applied here to learn and I'm still, I'm lucky enough to have the opportunity to audition for things. And when I, the next role that I got, I thought I have to concentrate on learning when I'm on set. I've got to enjoy this experience, but I need to open my eyes and ears because I was, I was prepared to do three years of just learning to try and get a job like this. So if I can be on set, I need to, I need to just open up my eyes and ears. And I also want to start to try and make choices within work for different types of, so I can do, do projects that will allow me to experiment with ways of working. So theatre was another thing. So doing, working hard to try and to try and get 
get to um to do a play because part of the reason for drama school was to work on voice because i i couldn't get seen for for, for theater auditions um and then also and then just different process of working like i then did a film sort of soon after that experience where um it was with a director who the film that he'd made before all pretty much all of the cast were were um had never acted before and had very similar situations in life to the characters that they were playing and he wanted to have an actor so that they could play around with the process but he didn't want to compromise on that authenticity so it was kind of like a version of trying out and he was like would you try method acting and like we and we spoke on the phone for months before the job began which i'd never had before and you know you change yourself physically in ways and mm. he would just do stuff which i hadn't thought of where he was it was playing a fellow who um uh he was he was selling stolen goods and he was like you need to be you need to be able to deal with money and you need to open your bag you need to be in and out of your bag as quick as anything and your bike money and your bag you need to be second nature with so you need to just practice going home rolling up you know you should go to a cash point and get a few notes out and just roll them up and put them in your sock out and in out and in out and in i want you so quick with that that you can do that without thinking and i sort of i'd never done anything to that detail before mm. and the same thing he was like cycle your bike always and with the bike that the character used he was like ride it ride it ride it and it was so sorry to go back to drama school. Of course, it was it was it was disappointing in the in the instance, but it was a really positive kind of kick up the bum to try and actively learn on the on the job. That's great. Now we should probably hear some of the many many questions that have been yeah, hanging away in my inbox. But first, we're going to kick off by getting someone up on screen to ask a question, camera to camera. Rich, our technical magician, is going to magic Millie onto our screens. Millie is a, a wonderful member of Playbox, the theatre behind Chatterbox. Um, hello, Millie, are you there? <laughs> hello, hello, there you are. How are you holding up in isolation, Millie? Great, thank you, yeah, not bad. <laughs> Excellent, and I think you've got a question for George. That, that's right, isn't it? Take it away. Yeah, um, well, it kind of leads on to what you're just talking about, really, but um, like a lot of my friends are, um, and I at Playbox are sort of nearing the age we're about to start our careers, hopefully. Um, and I was sort of wondering, you know, when you came to, you know, committing to becoming an actor and having that as a full time career, what was your experience with, you know, setting up professional things like agents and going to auditions and dealing with rejection and things like that? I think uh, it's, it's a really good question. I, I think um, I was very lucky with a, with a few things in terms of I had an agent that I that, that I was working with since I was. Uh, so I had an agent when I was. Um, 10 from Peter Pan and then she went back to she lived in Australia so she she went back home to Australia and I've um, changed to an agent I've been with since I was 14 a wonderful lady named Donna so I didn't I guess I didn't have the in one sense I didn't have to worry about having an agent to, to going to drama school to get an agent it was purely about the training um, but I guess when, when you sort of, when I committed to the idea in in my in my in my head and committed to the idea idea of acting i think i guess in terms of like advice but just to try and do as much as you can i think it's um it's so tricky to you you commit to the idea of something and you don't really feel legitimate until you get a job basically until or, or if you continue to get jobs and that's you know that's you shouldn't you shouldn't let um let the work define you if that's what you want to do there are so many ways that you can keep doing and practicing and if as long as you're doing for yourself that is a massive that is a massive step and so proactive and important even if it's not necessarily recognized immediately by others in terms of like if your friends have got auditions reading lines with them like the amount of tapes that me and my mates have done for each other with each other is so integral to to keep in practice, to like keeping those muscles going. And it's sort of, of course you want to get the role, but it doesn't matter if you don't, if you don't get the roles at first or if friends are getting roles and you're, and you're not, but as long as you're doing when that when that sort of chance comes about, things kind of happen, move and happen so quickly. Um, you'll be, you'll just be in the best position possible. So it's, it's, it's finding a way that, that you can be, you can be practicing. Cause I think it's very disheartening to, to feel like time opening up when you haven't been doing it. And then the reality of an audition is it might be 15 minutes, you know, mm. it's, it might be that long. And if you've, if you've had one audition every few months and you feel like, Oh God, I've only done half an hour's acting in the last six months because that's sort of when it's been in front of an audience, but you mm. can be doing it all the time 
with your mates like my mate who's an amazing actor he's the lead actor in pride ben schnetzer he we were working on a job that he was about to prep before lockdown just to sort of work the scenes together because we like to work together and he was saying how him and his mates have started just of a, of a weekend sometimes getting a play down and like on a friday night is their friday we'll cook a dinner and read a play across the table to each other so that they can start discussing it when they're working when they're not working so i think um there's there's that i think preparation before auditions also he- helps you let them go because there's I definitely got way more no's than yeses and do get no more, you know, more no's than yeses. And in terms of getting roles, and it's really tough to, to keep letting those, those, uh, to keep taking those. But the only way that I find that I can is if I know that I've done everything to try and get that role in the first, first place. So like, you know, really simple stuff like know your lines. If you've had the time, maybe even watching the director's work beforehand, um, having an idea for an offering. And so much of the time, you'll just be right for the part. But if you kind of make a concerted, you know, you've got your interpretation and that's all you can give. And if it feels right for them, that's fantastic. And you'll go on to develop, you know, a beautiful, you know, have a beautiful kind of uh, working relationship with whatever that project is. But if, it, if your offering isn't right, then that's, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not what they were looking for in that moment and it's easier to let go of those if you know that you've done done the work because it's it's a it's a horrible feeling to go away kind of going i feel like i could have done more you know mm-hmm. so, so just really like, nice about the the craft of it i think i think that's brilliant thoughts does that answer your question millie yeah that's really cool thank you <laughs> cheers millie thank, thank you so you. much for that thanks now, the Q&A box is buzzing, but we launched a poll earlier today on our Instagram takeover right. where anyone could submit a question for you, George. Okay. And we were inundated with answers. Um, and we had a public vote. And the question people would like to know the answer to with 62% of the vote. Oh, wow. lot, do you have any pre-audition rituals? Ooh. Um... Okay, yeah, I'm quite, it's funny. I'm just trying to think if there's anything specific. I'm quite superstitious in general. Um, yeah, well, well, actually, I do everything in threes and fives. If I run the scenes, I, I can't run them in even numbers. I don't know why. That's just my thing. Um, I have to run them three times or five times. But actually, and then six, I, I, I can do an even number with six. It's either three, five, or six um, in running them. That would be sort of my main audition is... So it was my, I guess before auditions is if you can do the lines with someone before before you get on the before you get on the tube to to go there or something. Um, that's that's the best prep that I reckon I could say would be to speed run them, you know, just for words, just so you've got them out there, and then just also just do them to muck around, like do them just just throw them away a wee bit, just with, with someone, just do it and do them three times and then leave them three to, like three or five times. That would be. That would be my my ritual beforehand, but otherwise I don't. Know. Know. Three three or five times. There's the there's the ritual. I'm, I'm good with odd numbers. It needs to be three or five. Like I can't. I feel funny if I do them two or four. <laughs> well, Ken Massey from the Philippines. Thank you for that question. Um, so here we go. Right at the top of the inbox here is a question from Aisha. Uh, mm-hmm. She says, seeing that it's Pride, and this had so many votes, by the way. Right. Seeing that it's Pride Month. She wants to know what you learned from doing the film Pride. Oh, in, in also, I mean, like socially or creatively, like everything there was, I think, I mean, the biggest lesson from Pride was just the power of doing, I guess to an extent, and like a little bit what we were talking about with Millie, but just more about what LGSM and the miners did about sort of standing up for what they believe in and taking action to make action. And that any any small, any step towards positive change is better than no step. You know, that's the thing that it, that's the thing that I think the idea when what you want to surmount in whatever it is, if it's social change, if it's personally, the often the idea of it seems so huge that you kind of, you sort of feel like I can't, what's, what's the point in starting? Like, how, how am I going to change that? If it's something in yourself or behavior, if it's something about the world that you don't agree with, but that those guys in LGSM literally started coins in buckets at a march. And those coins in buckets turned into a meeting, which turned into more coins in buckets, which turned into, you know, 
Paddy Considine's character died Donovan coming down and making a speech, which turned into a relationship between two communities, which turned into a movement, which turned into this, which turned into that, and it bubbles. And I think just not being not being scared of the first step, however small it may seem, is better than no step. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing that Pride taught me. That's great. Um, Hannah would like to know what your dream role would be. Oh, this, it's so funny because, like... Th- so many of like the roles which have meant most to me I could never have dreamed up in the first place like I've I feel I the I I played um a man called Ned Kelly um in a film which we actually filmed two years ago but came out just before the lockdown um and that process is means so much to me and that character has become very important to me but I would never have thought that that could I would never have thought to, to to pick him because also this version of him was very specific to the director's vision. And the point of it is, is it's a kind of antithesis of the understanding of who this man was, you know, by most people. Um, and similarly, Schofield is, I, f- I felt, I felt very akin to his way of being. I feel like, you know, I, I can't say how I would be in, you know, in the situation of that war, but just as, as humans, I, f- I, f- I felt akin to his his kind of manner and his way of being in a lot of ways. Um, but until, you know, that audition comes through, I could never have dreamt up Will Schofield. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say. Well, and that links quite nicely, actually, into a question here from Millie, who says, do you feel as though you carry parts of your characters into your daily life? Yeah, definitely. I, in some ways, yeah, they... Inf- oh, it's a mixture of, like, either... It's, it's like I think that I'm learning more and more that such an important part of the character is, is is understanding the context where they're from and therefore how they see the world, because you sort of you it's a, it's a mixture of applying your own understanding and sort of just reacting, which ultimately you kind of react as you to an extent. There is an element of just you reacting to that situation, drawing upon your own experience of the life. But then I guess when you're playing someone you also need to kind of couple that and let yourself be overtaken by their understanding of the world and how you view the world and I think just simply trying to do that with lots of different people's heads and hearts rather than them specifically but just the learnings of what some of the characters that I've played value or the or how it feels to be them um has definitely it's definitely kind of carried across in in day to day and it's just sort of picking and choosing what's healthy to keep hanging on to and what's what's best to let go great um this is a question from eliza i don't think there's anything barbed in this question did you have singing lessons when you were younger or was this a new skill when you were cast in sunshine only <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a new skill I, um it was we were very very nervous actually I think a lot of us were very nervous to be doing a musical because one about our singing voices and you know, just not feeling confident as singers. But um, so no, I, I sung sung in the school choir when I was young, but um, before my voice broke. And so, and I, I, I enjoyed singing. Like I, I played in a band with a friend just after school for a wee while and sort of did the backing vocals, did the U's and R's. Our singer was a much better singer. Um, and so I, I you know, I, I, I sung a wee bit, but it was, it was, it was Sunshine on Leaf that kind of was, you know, we had to, so we did. And and again, in sort of doing things that, that frighten you, it was it was a really joyous experience because like singing, like when you fall, you fall hard. Like there were a lot of like missed notes and especially the big ones where you're like, ah, like, <laughs> and, and, and when you do that, you sort of hit rock bottom quite quickly, but you do that mutually and therefore it really bonds you and you know how sort of vulnerable that is. So when someone else does it, it's kind of like you sort of have a laugh, but then you also, you don't because you sort of respect, I know exactly how embarrassed you are right now. <laughs> so let's, and I know how great it is when you make it, you know? So, um, uh, make the note, you know? Um, so yeah, it wasn't, it was a new skill, but it was joyous. I like singing, but I'm just you know, out of practice. <laughs> That's great. Jenny would like to know whether you've learned any new skills during quarantine or she says weird new hobbies. Weird new hobbies. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, I've, well, there's something. There's something. There's, I'm sort of reticent to kind of give anything away. I've, I'm, pra- I'm preparing for a, for a role um, at the minute um, about young a young man who um, feels that he's 
a, a wolf. Um, and there's been some new learnings from that. But I kind of, I, we haven't even got started yet from, from, the, from the sort of rehearsals up and running again. So I'm sort of reticent to say what, what they are, but, but that's been some new learnings. Um, uh, and otherwise just cooking more. <laughs> I, I like cooking, but I really like cooking. Um, but um, yeah, now I'm taking more time over breakfast, I think. Cooking and howling in the park. Yes, basically. <laughs> Um, Amelia would like to know, do you think you would be where you are now um, if you had not been spotted at school? Uh, no, no. I think, I, I really don't know how it would have been. I would like to f to think that I would, I feel like I would try and find my way into acting or, you know, the creative industry. I loved drama at school from a young age um, and loved it when I wasn't doing it you know in professional professional work i i love drama at school and um i've always been inspired by film and theater and been lucky as i was growing up to see a lot of film and theater so i think i would try and go down that path but absolutely i don't know i don't know how i would get into it and and that's i guess one thing to sort of talk about is i'm 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 aware of how well, aware and sometimes not aware of like how lucky i was to have chanced upon this mm. because I'm sort of I think feeling more and more now excuse me getting over the last few few years getting a sense of you know you get a sense of yourself and the work that you want to be a part of the work that you want to try and do the things that you want to say the stories that speak to you and the idea of doing that uh, you know at, at 18 or or in your early twenties, when whenever people might be auditioning for drama school, and having the a mixture of kind of meeting, like having the strength of character to go, I want to do this kind of work. I want to work with these people in this way. I want to express these stories, mixed with the reality of, I've got I've got to pay these bills. Um, I've got I've only just met my agent, and I don't want to mess around with this relationship. Um, I know that this is a good opportunity, but it's not exactly what I want to do. Like how you sort of, I think it, it's, 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 uh, it's, I don't know necessarily. I think everyone's sort of navigation of that is their own, but I think it's a real re kind of, ideally you sort of are purely, um, uh, 100, as we should, should aim to be kind of a hundred percent sort of artistic and moralistic in every decision that you make. But I guess the reality sometimes of, if you've moved to a different city to take, you know, to pursue this career is that it will, it will mean that you might have to do different types of work than you think. And it's, it's, I guess, about sort of the flexibility of taking the positive out of every, every experience and not, and not doing anything that you don't feel comfortable with, you know, if even though if you don't feel like you've got the ground to say no to stuff early on, um, but I think, I think that's I guess that's the one power that people do have. Is I think it's important to try and do as much as possible. But then, by the same token, someone once said to me about he was a freelance worker. He said the only this, the only choice that you do have is what you don't do in in a sense, um, and that that was important as well about kind of carving out the choices as as you go along. But I think it is. Um, it is tricky when you're when you're starting out and you're sort of working all of it out presently. Amazing. Eile would like to know, um, and this is something we were sort of talking about before um, we started. How how do you think the acting industry will change in the next few years? Whether that's the effects of COVID, Black Lives Matter, or anything else. I think. I think there's got there, there's got to be a massive change, and there there will be change. I think firstly. I think in terms of like Black Lives Matter and what's going on socially at the moment, I think this is a this is a real shake up in terms of understanding that it's been uh, the way that who like the stories that are told and who tells the stories has been massively unbalanced for a very long time in both gender and race, um, class even, and and. And that needs to be completely rebalanced. And I think therefore that will, we'll, we'll see that in the coming years and we'll see an active push because it will need a conscious effort because the problem is with, um, with so many of the problems at the minute is they're systemic, you know, they're, they're almost unconscious. And so it's going to take a conscious push 
push the other way to make active change that hopefully will then become ingrained because at the minute we're ingrained in something that is is having in a lot of ways can, can have a negative effect um without it ever being seen as as malicious or overt because it's something that is kind of unconscious and so it's going to take the conscious change of this profound moment at the minute to kind of to be continued for a wee while to make that change i think um and then in terms of the pandemic with covid i think it's going to see everything being a, a wee bit more localized just because the logistical stuff of we're used to tra traveling people this way everywhere for for productions and for doing it on a whim and for you know traveling people back and forth places sometimes you might film for a week come home for a week go for out for a week and i think the the effect that you know of climate change at the minute and everything that's being looked at again consciously we need to make an effort to 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 come back from this and the, and, the, and the stillness that has been caused in terms of global movement from from covid is we've seen the profound effects positively on the environment already um, in terms of emissions and things, as well as just the logistics of having to quarantine perhaps two weeks for somewhere. So rather than if you've got a few days filming, you might have to quarantine two weeks there and quarantine two weeks when you come back home again. So people just might not make that trip and it will see kind of, I guess, people using, which I think could be, it could be a very positive thing as well, much more kind of localised crews and casts um, in terms of all creative productions. That's so interesting. Uh, look, George, we've got about five minutes to go. Shall we do we make these last few kind of quick fire yes. questions? See how many we can get through because there are so many. Right. Um, Fliss would love to know um, which of your characters you've, that you've played are you most like? Uh, uh, probably the first two world, first world war ones: um, Tomo, peaceful and private, peaceful, and then Schofield and Lance Corporal. Uh, it's Lance Corporal Schofield. Great. Victoria would like to know, do you prefer stage acting or movies? Uh, genuinely both, because what I love about either one is what's different about the other. Like, I love the fact that you will spend an entire day on what amounts to be 30 seconds in the film. And then I also love the fact that you go start to finish in two hours, whatever happens. Great. Nadia would love to know, what's the hardest part of starting a new project? Um, just the first day nerves, I think. Excellent. Uh, Lucrezia says, are there any actors that have influenced the way you act? Uh, Eddie Marzan, um, particularly, um, because his respect for everyone else that he's working with gives him a massive amount of respect for himself. And so it kind of, it, a respect for others actually gives him works, like it gives him a confidence in what he needs. And, and his professionalism is just um, paramount. Uh, Hannah. What would your dream job be besides acting? Um, God, I'd love probably something in this. I would love to. I would love to direct something one day. But if I could have any talent in the world, I'd be a pro surfer. A pro surfer. Mm. Like riding waves for a living, like it'd be the best. Great, um, Aisha. What makes an actor's director to you? I love directors that give very clear intention or what they want, like from a scene but leave you completely open to how you do that. So I like, I remember I did a, a film called For Those in Peril with a director called Paul Wright. And there was a scene where my character, we were sort of improvising around um, the, the, the scene and he just said, scare her. And it was really, I knew exactly what I needed to do in the situation, but I just let it left, was then left to me to do it in any way that I wanted. And that is both very freeing and clear. And that's really positive. Great. Jordan asks, how do you choose which projects you work on? I think it's a mixture. I mean, any element of choice in work is, is a real blessing. And I, but, but I think it's a mixture of you are, it's like a, a big and a small in terms of the bigger picture of the message that this, that the film is or the play or the, the project is putting out there or everyone making it from yourself to transport, to camera, to lights, to costume, you're all cogs in a giant machine so do you want to get behind that machine ethically what it's saying um you know what's it putting out into the world do you want to be a cog within that and do you want to put that forward that simple choice is is a big thing because it sort of doesn't matter about you then it just matters about the story and then the small is personally what's this process going to teach me like even if this story is not something that i thought was at first that my kind of you know, my, the, the story that I was necessary or the character that I would have immediately gone for, this director is asking me to 
go method. He's asked me to disappear into the role for two months, or this director has asked me to become a boxer. I need to learn what is the, and it's the, the, the personal skill or experience or process that you want to go for is, is another massive consideration of mine as to what they, how they want to make it. That's great. Sophie would love to know if you were to do a biopic, who would it be? Biopic, who would it be? Um, oh God, I just, I, I genuinely don't know. Um, I, I was like, I'm immediately going to like all my favorite musicians, but then I don't know if I ever could because like, I don't know, like Bob Dylan or Jeff Buckley or something like that, you know, but you know, I don't know if you could. <laughs> This must be a famous pro surfer. We could sit find. Was, yeah, I go on and I'll do Mick Fanning, the biography of Mick Fanning. Great. Um, Hannah would love to know what has been the highlight of your career so far? Uh, genuinely, there's, I, I couldn't pick one moment because the, the beauty of this job or this, you know, this getting to do this is it teaches you so much about the world and yourself. And there's been some profound kind of creative discoveries. But then I've also met some of the people, you know, the people I love most in in, in my life I've been I've met through through work so that is you know that's that's the biggest thing great um Eile, this will probably have to be our last question I think what's the most important thing you've learned during your career I think again it's that respect of other people gives you a respect for yourself I think like a, um, a genuine uh, consideration and respect for what and how someone is doing something allows you to respect what and how you do that's great well look, that just about concludes episode one of chatterbox but look before we wrap up george i wondered if you'd be kind enough to share your lockdown list with us a selection of things to keep us stimulated in isolation okay early mornings i'm an early riser anyhow but either if you're living at home with your family or if you're in a city and the outdoor spaces are taken up I've been recently getting up really early, like, you know, quarter to five or something, going out, doing your thing, and then going back to bed for two hours. Like, you know, and then go back to bed from like six to eight or something. That's really, the world is magic at that time of the morning. And yeah. and whatever, if it's like writing or exercise or just a walk, like, where it, because it's summertime, it's light at half four at the minute. So I reckon get up early, get up at six, and just see the day like sunrises are beautiful that's one of the other good things with this job is that you have to get up early loads especially if you know for filming and you see so many sunrises which i hadn't before and they're amazing so get up early because you can have lots of space and time in that kind of first hour of the day and then you can always go back to bed because you know we're still working from home um the other thing is my friend put me on to the broken record podcast and there's an amazing interview with andre 3000 and rick rubin in conversation the broken record podcast um exercise definitely keep exercising i my head spins out if i don't exercise so whatever it is find and do different ways be it like yoga or youtube or a mate just exercising don't stop exercising um just for health and mental state i reckon and then i'm saying this it takes me about months to read a book um, and I'm still reading a book called Light Years by James Salter. But a friend gave me his book, another book written by him called Solo Faces, and his writing's really amazing. Um, so if you need a book to read, James Salter is a kind of apparently from my friend, he's like the writer's writer. Um, so he's not that well known in terms of like, you know, all the big names of novels, but he's, he's his work's amazing. So. That's so great. What a wonderful list. Thank you for sharing that. Cool. Um, now, that is all we've got time for today. Join me same time next week when I'll be talking to the star of Gangs of London, Black Mirror, The Huntsman Winter's War, Corey Lanus at the RSC, Death of a Salesman in the West End. It's the one and only Chope Dirisu. Now, in the spirit of keeping the creative conversation going week to week, I think you've got a question for Chope. Is that right, George? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Chope and I did a radio play together once. Um, uh, I've got a question for Shopee, and my question is: so Firstly, hello Shopee. I hope you're going well. Um, it is: if you weren't doing this job as as an actor, either what would you be doing? Was there something that um, that you almost did instead, or would there is there something that you would like to do? And does that thing play into how you are an actor? Amazing. Yeah. Well, tune in to see how Shopee answers that one. 
Um, if you've enjoyed today's episode and you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can head over to youtube.com forward slash playbox theatre where you'll find our back catalogue of amazing actors. And don't forget, we'd love to hear what you think. So send us your thoughts, reactions, feedback to at playbox theatre, hashtag chatterbox on whatever social media channels you like to use. But before you all go, I would love to take a moment to say thank you to Playbox Theatre, the youth theatre behind Chatterbox. Now, I was a member of Playbox growing up and it meant the world to me. Not only did it give me a chance to express myself, but it set me up with an incredible community of like-minded people and it gave me some lifelong friends. And I know Playbox is not alone in this, but they're having a tough time at the moment and could really use your support. So please, if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to support the company who make it, head over to justgiving.com and search for Playbox Theatre. No donation amount is too small or indeed too large. Um, and I know these are tough times. So look, if you can't donate, don't stress. Instead, find somebody you know and like and tell them about Chatterbox instead. All that needs me to do is say a final thank you to George Mackay for joining us today. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. I'll go. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to all our new Chatterbox partners up and down the country. We couldn't do it without you. And thank you to all of you for watching. So until next Friday, stay creative and see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>